Harry Anslinger started. You know who Harry Anslinger is, don't you? I do not, unfortunately. You never, well, you should, because he's your great-grandfather. He started this war in the 30s, and he was tuned out, too. And it was a war on Hispanics and African Americans. And that's when they made marijuana illegal was in the 30s. And it was all directed at those people. It still continues to this day. It's 85 years since Anslinger started this. And it's a, the fact that we spent so much time arresting people is sinful. Welcome to Newsbeat, an unconventional examination of conventional wisdom. Newsbeat is produced and distributed by MP Studios, a division of Mori Publishing. Newsbeat. Listen. Learn. One trillion dollars. That's how much the United States has spent in the last 40 years on the war on drugs. Currently, more than 450,000 Americans are imprisoned for drug offenses, up from 40,000 in 1980. In the federal system alone, almost half of all inmates are drug offenders. Despite the government's investment in this war, America remains the number one country in the world for illicit drug use. And in 2015, overdose deaths reached an all-time high, claiming 50,000 lives. To better understand this endless drug war, we wanted to find out how it all started. And the trail led to a man most Americans have never heard of. In this episode, we hear from Johan Hari, author of Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. Maya Solovitz, author of Unbroken Brain, A Revolutionary New Way of Understanding Addiction. Alex Clermont, a prison reform activist. And Silent Night a prolific recording and performing artist and frontman of the band called Fuse. I'm Rashad Mion, managing editor of Newsbeat. This is the true origins of the war on drugs. In 1939, Billie Holiday, the great jazz singer, walked on stage in a hotel in Midtown Manhattan. Um, she wasn't even allowed to walk through the front door uh, because... She was African-American. She had to go through this. They made her go through the service elevator. And that night, for the first time, she sang a song. It's a song lots of your listeners will know. It's called Strange Fruit. Southern trees bear strange fruit. It's a song against lynching. Blood on the leaves. It imagines, it, the, the song describes... And blood at the root. The bodies of African American men. Black bodies swinging. Hanging from trees in the south. In the southern breeze. The, she describes that as the strange fruit hanging. The strange fruit of the south. From the poplar trees. Her, her goddaughter, Lorraine Feather, said to me, You've got to understand how challenging this was for an African-American woman to stand up in front of a white audience and sing a song against lynching was unheard of. And that night, Billie Holiday received a warning from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, who were the federal agency in charge of enforcing the drug laws. And they basically said, stop singing this song. And if you want to understand where the war on drugs begins, and why it continues, I think this moment in American history is, is really important. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees By the same who bringing in the poppy seeds Yet they blame you, call it an atrocity You a scapegoat, you ain't make the policies See the bigger picture The rich are getting richer You slanging on the corner But who's the real slinger and who's the real pitcher? Who you point the finger Think you know the story But really just the gist of Let that one linger It's not just unfortunate That the victims of this war are disproportionate It's not some innocent mistake How they enforcing it then Treat the symptom, but never the cause of it. Then they got the gall to say slavery was so long ago. We need to move on so we can be level C. But if the human being who wrote the law is racist, what you think that law itself gonna be? So the man who's responsible for this warning to Billy Holiday is a man called Harry Anslinger, who is probably the most influential person who no one's ever heard of. He's the man who invents the modern war on drugs way before Nixon, way before Reagan. He's the first person who's using the phrase war on drugs way back in the 1930s. The Treasury Department intends to pursue a relentless warfare against the despicable 
dope peddling vulture who preys on the weakness of his fellow man. To understand him, you have to understand who he was. He was a government bureaucrat, and he takes over the Department of Prohibition just as alcohol prohibition is ending. So he's inherited this big government bureaucracy, this enormous government bureaucracy uh, that's about to be put out of business. And he wants to keep his government department going. He helps to turn it into the Bureau of Narcotics and he builds the new purpose for his department around the two intense hatreds that he has. One is an intense hatred of African-Americans and Latinos. And it's important to understand, he was regarded as a crazy racist in the 1920s, which is, a, you have to be super racist to be regarded as racist. And he used the N word so often in official government memos that his own senator said he should have to resign. The other group he really hated was people with addiction problems, addicts. He believed that addicts were like lepers. They had to be, they had to be quarantined. They had to be cut off from the rest of the, the society or they would spread. They were contagious, he said. So as Anslinger is building what he is the first person to call the war against drugs, the only drugs that were banned in the United States were heroin and cocaine. And you couldn't build a very big department around a war on heroin and cocaine. They were very minority tastes in the United States. And one of the things Harry Anslinger does is he radically changes his position on marijuana. Up till the early 1930s, Anslinger had said cannabis was not a dangerous drug, we shouldn't ban it, and he suddenly changes course. He announces that cannabis is the most dangerous drug in the world. He said that if heroin bumped into cannabis on the staircase, heroin would drop dead of fear. And he latched onto a particular case. In Florida, in the early 30s, there was a boy called Victor Lycada. He was a um, young Latino man in his early 20s who hacked his family to death with an axe. And Anslinger, with the help of Hearst News, which was the kind of Fox News of the day, announces, this is what will happen if you smoke cannabis. You will hack your family to death with an axe. You might think I'm joking. This is literally what he says. He says that cannabis makes people murderous. It makes them delirious. It makes them think time has slowed down. Time has slowed down. So a single second seems to last a thousand years. He writes 30 leading scientists to say, you know, what are the dangers of cannabis? 29 of them write back and say, as far as we know, this isn't a significantly dangerous drug. And one writes back and says, yeah, it's really bad. That's the only one he quotes. That's the only Harry one he J. quotes. Harry J. Anslinger, Commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. He's the inventor of modern drug prohibition. He was unusually gifted at channeling the fears and hysterias of American society at that time. He's also influential in imposing this on the rest of the world. It's easy to forget this now, but drugs were legal in most of the world when Harry Anslinger arrives in office, and cannabis was legal in the United States. Anslinger has promised that once you ban these drugs, they'll disappear, they'll be got rid of, your addiction will be a distant memory. Now, of course, the drugs don't disappear, obviously. So Anslinger needs to invent a new reason why this has happened. And he says, well, it's the Latinos, it's the Mexicans, it's Latin America and the Chinese. In fact, he says they are doing it as part of an orchestrated communist conspiracy to weaken the United States. And he particularly says in words that are uncannily similar to what Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions say now, that the United States has a drug problem because of Latinos flooding the country with drugs. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Psychologically, politically, morally, we need to say, as Nancy Reagan said, just say no, don't do it. There's no excuse for this, it's not recreational. It can be destructive uh, and it consistently is destructive. Lives are at stake and uh, we're not gonna worry about being fashionable. And we're already seeing the death and destruction that results from the prevalence of drugs in America and the argument's not going to be that hard to win in, in the months to come. Well, it could be Harry Anslinger speaking. You know, he quotes Nancy Reagan's Just Say No. For the sake of our children, I implore each of you to be unyielding and inflexible in your opposition to drugs. Our young people are helping us lead the way. Not long ago in Oakland, California, I was asked by a group of children what to do if they were offered drugs. And I answered, 
just say no. Who's standing there with her is that poor young woman who starred in different strokes, who in fact dies of an overdose not long after, gives you some sense of how well the Just Say No campaign worked. A study found that kids who went through the Just Say No program were in fact slightly more likely to develop drug problems than kids who didn't. It's a ridiculous message. It's based on a misunderstanding about what addiction is. How we supposed to take them serious with a message so ridiculous, either purposely malicious or just delirious. Just say no, they don't understand addiction. Or they do, but just more focus on the pigment Before Bush, before Reagan, before Nixon When Harry and Slinger got in this position They were throwing black and brown folks in prison We still fighting the same war, that's sickening And no coincidence when it's all cemented Right after the ban of alcohol ended Now enter the reef of madness How they can keep the balance How they can keep the money coming in The fear implanted And act like packed jails equal treatment Like it's a smart way to keep people clean When the fact is really it's nothing close to the plan doesn't work or it works how it's supposed to the history of our drug laws is a history of racist panics people believe that it makes black people impervious to bullets black men rape white women want to seduce white women chinese railroad workers oh they were going to use this drug to seduce or rape white women mexicans and jazz musicians they're going to sleep with white women it's all about fear of people taking white women it sounds ludicrous But you read this stuff and you're like, people created these panics based on absolutely no facts. It's never actually about how harmful this drug is. We criminalize it because we want to get at certain groups of people. And Nixon really takes off on that. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. And this is part of the Southern strategy, this Republican idea that we can win over these racist Democrats um, by appealing to their racism. And we can get the South if we just sort of covertly say things like inner city crime and evil hippies, you know, and we can get those voters over to our side by cracking down on crime. And that's a code for cracking down on people of color. And that strategy is admitted. So John Ehrlichman was one of the henchmen for Richard Nixon. In his own words, he says, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. Then when President Reagan comes into office, you have the second big wave of this drug war. Leading medical researchers are coming to the conclusion that marijuana, pot, grass, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most dangerous drug in the United States. And the Democrats just buy right into this, and they end up sort of fighting with each other about who can be more tough on crime because they're tired of losing elections. And you get this just escalation, and in the Bush years, in the 90s, like, if you tried to say anything, like, criminal penalties for drugs clearly don't work, you were like a traitor in the drug war. The media just bought right into all this stuff, and, and all of these panics cannot happen without complicity of the media. The fact that the U.S. has one-fifth of the world's population, 20% of the world's prisoners, I think is directly connected to uh, what's been happening the last 40 years. If you look at the United States of America, or even just the world, in its approach to drugs and its approach to imprisonment, it seems really strange. Someone who is addicted to drugs has a health issue. Someone who is selling drugs has an economic issue. There's no other way for them to get money, or they see there's no other way for them to get uh, money for them to continue and support their family. Yet look at the system as it is and see that prison is being used as a coverall solution for mental health, as a coverall solution for those who are poor, as a coverall solution for a number of things that are social problems, things that we're not confronting as a society, things we're not giving proper solutions to in this world. We're using prison to just fill up and, and take in those folks who are left behind. The war on drugs is a 
huge part of mass incarceration. It's one of the reasons why we had this ballooning in the 70s, why we continued growing the prison population in the 80s under Reagan, and why it grew even further under Clinton. We are still living in Harry Anslinger's drug war. We are living with all the bans he introduced. We are living with the racist prejudices that he absolutely fused with the drug war. Um, you know, the man who stalks and plays a role in Billie Holiday's death because he cannot tolerate an African-American woman singing a song against white supremacy created this war and all of those prejudices still animate it. African-American men are no more likely to use or sell drugs than any other ethnic group in the United States. They make up the overwhelming majority of the people who are in prison for it. And the brutality towards people with addiction problems that we've seen, that, that, that was pioneered by Anslinger, absolutely is the, the norm for what we do today. All over the United States, we, we, we have a policy uh, towards addicts that is based on shame, punishment and stigma. It's just what we did to Billie Holiday. It's just what Harry Anslinger wanted. And it has just the same effect. It devastates people. It makes people's addictions worse. And, and, it, and, it, and it causes a lot of deaths. To understand war is to understand the country. To know that is to know white supremacy. And how almost every issue of contempt has a root that's connected to that legacy. It could be plain as day, but still buried. Or strain little by little like a levy. As hypocritical as it is deadly Tighter the squeeze for the black of the berry Almost a century fighting this so-called war on People of color on, the working poor on People that's weak on, people that's sick on People that need help, not a quick fix They show Lady Day this was a man's world And, well, message received The racism is so systematic that they could admit it And we still let them breathe Newsbeat is produced and distributed by MP Studios, a division of Mori Publishing. The producer of Newsbeat is Michael Conforti. The editor-in-chief of Newsbeat is Christopher Tawarski. The managing editor of Newsbeat is Rashad Mian. The executive producer of Newsbeat is Jed Mori. Show notes are available on usnewsbeat.com. Subscribe today on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. 